topics are there? There have been quite a variety of topics today, from the, the, the lowest mass, 0.3 solar mass, as we mentioned, to the, the highest mass of Ada Korea. Uh, so pick your mass and ask your questions. <laughs> Anyone wants to start? Um, I have a question for Johannes. Yeah, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Um, you say you have like this um, rotating globe structure. Do you have an idea or a plan to model this, or do you have an idea how this would be formed, or is it just that it gets the end of the momentum from the start? Uh, the the only idea was just to try and recreate what I was observing. So I don't know how this is created. I don't know if there is uh, uh, another component, for example, that would create. That. So I don't know um, how this created. My the way I try to the way I try to do it just to recreate what I'm observing. Okay, so it's just to, so it explains the observational results very good. But you until now don't have a model. Thank you. Can you repeat again this this geometry or your your you're talking about because I think it's really important and it's not clear. So you have lobes but you have faster equator, right? So you, Yes, the, the lobes are equatorial. So the star rotates and the lobes uh, rotate. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, because, sorry, I didn't, understand, I didn't understand your question before. The answer is 1.7 kilometers per second. And, and what is what roughly is the stellar radius you said? The stellar radius is uh, uh, 1.5 astronomical units. So well below break this. That was no question. Question of far back. I, I have a question following well, doesn't follow the question but it's about the same topic. Um, I was wondering about the bases. So are you pumping the bases with the shock or the bases are you like moving them around? Is it the same gas or, or um, the pumping mechanism is uh, not clear, so there are models that can reproduce that both by conditional pumping and related pumping. So there's no way for me to tell you what exactly pumps the basins. Uh, it might be a combination of two, it might depend on the phase, it might depend on the uh, So what was the, the, the question? <laughs> yeah, no, it was that. I mean, can you, do you know if, the, if have you any pump like what I want to understand is if you are actually moving the gas, or you just the shock is just going through the gas and it's popping the mindset. So I want to know if, if you're moving the mindset or just sort of to just see the way because of the shock. Well, the moving that the mindset is most probably moved because of the shock. So it's the shock that moves them away from the star. But I don't know if it is the shock that actually pumps the mindset. So you're saying that the mindset are not co-moving the gas, but co-moving the shocks. Um. Well, according to what I see now, at least how it looks like. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Another the microphone is coming. Well, so it's about the pumping. As you know very well, the question is that the variation of, of the intensity, the total intensity, is very well correlated with the infrared <laughs> variation of the star. But the arrival of the shock there is no reason to be exactly in phase with the maximum of the infrared, and not only for this star, but for many other stars. For that, for that reason, one would say that the, the, the pumping can be independent of the shock, and in fact, due to radiation. Yes. Any comments? Uh, well, we have a transition from, uh, from, from the second vibrational state, I have reduced the data as well. It's only for the second part of the project. Um, the, we see a lot of overlapping in the major spots, but then again, both radiantly, radiantly pump models can produce the same thing. So there's no way for me to tell you exactly uh, what pumps the laser. From Denis' presentation, I was not clear at the end whether the, their, uh, the, the interpretation of the abundance variation, 
that was that in, in, in bipolars and the analyticals, if we're interpreting them right, or should we correct for the, for the appearance? Because you're showing that, they, that we have some bias towards, towards the interpretation of the abundance. So can you put the bottom line that you didn't give us? You gave us a lot of details, but you didn't say the bottom line. Yeah, there are two facts. The first thing is that if you take the set of equations in the way you have now, we, uh, the result, for instance, for nitrogen, as a function of the temperature of the center star, is that we overestimate the nitrogen abundance, for instance. And for the oxygen, it's the opposite. So, and the point is that I cannot, uh, there is a variation with shape and with the temperature of the center star. And I need to take into account the two things in order to correct uh, the way we derive this abundance. So, uh, putting all of this together, it's, kind of, it's not that easy because uh, we would have uh, easily one equation for each temperature, each range of temperature, but then temperature and the different morphologies. So, if you take, if you give me a spectrum of a bipolar one group, which from the spectrum you can uh, obtain the temperature of the center star, and it is kind of easy. So I can I can tell you that using King's Book and Marlowe's recipes, we need to add a correction of 20% or 15% in the case of nitrogen for or oxygen and medium and so That is quite an important point. Yeah. Because with the, the type 1 classification we showed that bipolarity in a high N of rho and together. <coughs> now, uh, were we wrong? Was the N of rho just wrong and it's only bipolarity? Yeah, there are two different things. One is that I'm telling that we are overestimating the nitrogen abundance and a little bit underestimating the oxygen abundance. So, if you take the radius, it's not that serious the problem. You know, but if you are only taking the nitrogen or neon or whatever, we are, you know, the results you have are just wrong for a factor that it can be 20% uh, and up to 50% if you're talking about sulfur, for instance. Yeah, Ursula, it's behind you. Uh, can we put together a sample? So we heard a lot about aging stars today, but also on the first day. Um, and I was talking to Clara earlier, so her uh, work on the VLTI on 15 objects shows uh, no, not much asymmetry, was it one or two objects? Uh, uh, on the scale of uh, a few to about 10 AU, um, looking at the dust, right, because of the VLTI sensitive too. Then Ragvendra talked about uh, both a radio uh, survey as well as an optical survey of structures that are probably a little bit bigger. Uh, all, again, also of aging stars, and those surveys show that 20 and 30 percent of the uh, investigated objects show the asymmetries. Um, I'm finding it hard to kind of put all these pictures together. Of course, they come from different wavelengths, different emitters, uh, but we're still talking about aging stars, maybe a slightly different uh, scales. So, can you put it together for me, uh, Claudia, or maybe like Ben? Or... Okay, from my side, uh, what I can say is that. Uh, uh, we had only a few objects where we were sampling these low visibilities uh, because we didn't know the size of the objects, so when we choose the basement. So, uh, and it seems that these asymmetries, if they are thumbs or whatever, show up at these visibilities. So it seems that uh, we do not see like uh, disks of pronounced elasticity if there are uh, asymmetries like uh, patchy structure clumps. Uh, we think they are there, we see them in a few cases, in the other cases we see that they are there, but we are not really sure. Okay? So we need to imagine some of these. Claire, do you want to add anything to that? Well, just to say that for Mindy and Humber, you have to select you have to select your baseline beforehand, and sometimes if you miss the point where the asymmetry is, you can't actually tell what is what. Um, well, okay, for upstream masking you have a completely plain coverage, so you can find the asymmetries, but not just the little ones that Claudia is probing the field to have. I would just like to add that, first of all, I would hate me to realization of the field, because, first of all, smaller misunderstandings. And then if you look at different techniques, you may just do 
zero if you have a particle that wants to this inside the planet. Whereas if you look at the main thread, like most likely the same thing as a machine. So in the same object, if you may try to get the same object, where you see this image is one data, you don't see this image is one data. That's simply a function of what you see. The scatter lights, it is easy to see. Cavities excavated by jets. But if you look at the main thread, you see hot dust, which is just going to see hot dust, which is only has to be close to this part. So you can miss it. So it's, it's a complicated issue. I think at the moment, I would be very careful about making generalizations about the number of fractions and stuff. What I think it would be really nice if, if we could coordinate and to study a sample of objects with different techniques. And then, I mean, this is what we started. We started from the mass sample, and then uh, when we see we were not yet that, not very lucky, but we will try again, and then we move to BD. We have already some observation from Amber, but we are really waiting for imaging now. So we will submit a proposal for this target for Pioneer, once the instrument we would like to come. So if somebody is volunteering to observe the same stars with other techniques, I think this is the way we should go if we would really want really to reconstruct the of the Are we just overly solving these mistakes? If an L2 pop is, there is some evidence that there is a disk that was from the SAO plane. And you see an extension, it's clear, uh, might, be, might be that, but that's a lower resolution than PLTI. So I'm just looking at too high resolution. That's probably But there's nothing in the video, is there? Now, if I try to use number of pioneer to see the imaging interferometers. I would look at uh, baselines of both telescopes, let's say from 20, sorry, 15 around and 1800 meters. Um, with, uh, with one telescope you get about 8 meters. So unless you have a complete coverage with everything, you can't really tell what it is. You might be missing something, that's for sure. And that's why you need a lot of objects, because they will have different distance and then Sorry, this is delivered this point a little bit, but interferometry on this is blocks. So, and that's just the nature of interferometry because you're not going to be using the interferometry. You always see blobs. So, when you see blobs in interferometry, you automatically assume that you see blobs, you have to be very careful. And if you look at the same structures, for example, RC 26, if you look at in the optical light, you see coherent structures, you see bipolar ring. Separate, this dusty thing separating a cone of light in one direction, two radial rays in another direction. When you look at that in two micron aperture mask in the front, it always see drops. So you have to be very careful with the front. Mm -hmm. We see your also <laughs> this, is this is also Yeah, yeah. I, mean, no, I know we have to be careful, and I'm very careful when I'm in the free space. Right. I hope we will improve with the images. <laughs> the, the UV coverage has improved a lot. With the, uh, the aperture masking, you always get full images nowadays. So it is not as much as a problem as it has been before. No. But it is puzzling that you see such different uh, structures, the uh, structures you might expect just down there. Yeah. Who's next? We still have uh, some time to fill. Well, this, this is a problem for the whole audience. I wonder how many uh, planetary nebula, which are sort of double uh, compact sources, and uh, we expect that they will become nobody. I mean, what is that? Do we expect some kind of, of uh, a time evolution that, that, that they might become nobody, any one of them? Because there are two nobody. With uh, in a plant, I mean, yeah, but how about the other way around? This goes to normal specialist. Well, I think the answer is that uh, any AGB star, right, that has a close companion, once it gets rid of the shell, it becomes a planetary nebula. If, the, if it's lost enough angular momentum, depending on the amount of specific angular momentum that's lost during that stage, it will end up as possibly a cataclysmic variable or a no. I mean, you guys are all worrying about the, the stage as it loses mass. 
Uh, we worry about what happens next. And certainly there are class of stars and symbiotics that have been mentioned more than once that uh, Shazreen studies very carefully. Uh, where they're busy losing mass, and if they lose enough mass, maybe they look like a planetary nebula. Uh, I was talking with uh, Albert after, uh, after teasing him a little. Uh, and, you know, G.K. Per, uh, were is one of the primary targets for a number of people. Uh, as I, I mentioned during my talk, Tina Lehmans has started, is studying the uh, the shell expanding, trying to understand the dynamics, uh, and uh, we need more information. Long slit spectroscopy of those two sh two uh, shells to look at the abundances could be very valuable. Should we expect no eruptions in planetary net that we cover? Depends on how much mass. In a, I mean, in a, in a talk that I didn't give here is where we look at what happens to the material being accreted. And it turns out uh, we expect now different kinds of outbursts depending on a variety of things, maybe more mass, sorry, uh, more mixing, less mixing. Uh, we could actually put out enough mass between outbursts just from trying to get the stuff onto the a white board that could look like a planetary nebula shell, but it probably wouldn't have as much mass unless there was a real long time between uh, no bowers. And following up on this, it also depends on uh, where the common envelope uh, in spiral ends, right? So right now we have no real good clue except we have the central stars of the end, which are blueprints for the common envelope. Uh, which have separations of a few or some. The simulations don't go anywhere near that. We, we're left with uh, tens of our suns. And if you have a massive companion, meaning like 0.5 and 6 solar masses, you're left with them further out. So no hope right now solving that. But there's no good reason to, to, to presume that you don't end up much closer. And in such a case, the no activity should start quite quickly. So maybe those objects that have a post common binary that's very close will start up activity while the PN is still ionized. Yeah, but GK third is not particularly close. No, GK third is two days. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question to a summer? So you are our CD person here, you're the only one. So you're caught in the back. And I, can I give you some homework? <laughs> but we've got to relate, so I am really bothered by this high mean, uh, low C2O ratio, um, two objects, maybe three, which we call born again, the end, right? They're low in uh, hydrogen, some, you know, those ejector may be hydrogen deficient. You mentioned one nova today that is hydrogen deficient, right? Which is funny, we call it, and it's probably the only one. That's B445. Yeah. Uh, and that, so, that shows these nice butterfly type. Yeah, the, that's right. Uh, ejecta. So and there's no sign of hydrogen <coughs> material being transferred onto the white core. Okay, no hydrogen. So that's the hydrogen deficient carbon star transfer. Probably. It's very luminous. But if you look at the, the, the high mean three board again objects and you try to plug a nova scenario, even being very fantasious, it's very hard because these objects like Able 58, whose central stars we see so five aquila has so many observations, the white curves going back to 1917, we have the PN, we have tons and tons of things. And if you try to put a NOVA in there, particularly not such a near NOVA, you really end up constraining and fine-tuning to death your parameter space. And then if you do a pop synthesis as we did to figure out how likely it is, it's basically it's not. Okay, so but what is going on? Is neon is the neon really an indication that we have an oxygen neon nova there? Or maybe is it a wrong observation? I mean my garden would say no because this neon abundances are very high, they're very sure. But what do we do with are there this? UV, excuse me, are there UV observations of this when you talk about the neon abundance? When we claim that we have highly enriched neon, we have IUE or HST where we see uh, 1602 neon 4, 2422 neon 4, and 1575 neon 5. No, these are, I think the ones that my Garland did and Roger Weston are uh, optical recombination lines. So the 33, 46, whatever it is, yeah. Okay. Now, there's the problem, of course, with an optical and 
situation, no? but I think that if you ask him, no, any way you turn, you end up with really high abundances. They're not the 2% that's expected for these kind of intershell links. Okay, I mean, one of the things that uh, we argue with the community about uh, in trying to make uh, classical novae one acre genitors is that if you look at the abundances in the ejecta of novae, they clearly, I'll say clearly, that maybe puts me right in the middle, uh, look like the white dwarfs are losing mass as a result of the outburst. Okay? You can take a white dwarf and whittle it down if it's still a lot of neon there, I mean, close to the surface, I mean, it's going to still eject. Uh, and it'll eject a lot of neon. I mean, one of the differences between the white dwarfs that you're studying in the central stars of planetary nebula and our white dwarfs are that in order to achieve the properties that we find, the white dwarfs have to be massive. They have to be, for an oxygen neon nova, the nuclear physics requires that the white dwarf uh, exceeds 